to run it? It's all you have. I can hear you. Hi, Karen. Thank you for coming to Copy It Right. I hope you didn't party too hard last night. Um, I'm Molly Fair, and my co-chair, Lauren Sorensen, and I wanted to convene this panel because we were inspired by the issues raised in the book, The Emergence of Video Processing Tools, Television Becoming Unglued, which was co-edited by Kathy Hyde, Mona Jimenez, and Sherry Hawking. The topic of preserving tools and systems used to create early video work are not typically talked about at EMEA and um, not sufficiently addressed necessarily in other conservation fields. So our panelists today are going to discuss scholarship in this area, efforts to document these histories and the collective knowledge of artists and engineers, issues in restoration, and possibilities for art-making, tool development, and conservation that could be carried out in tandem. So first, we're going to hear from Carolyn Tennant and Kathy High via Skype, who are going to talk about the work and history of the Experimental Television Center. And then we're going to hear from Mona Jimenez about the issues and questions around preserving video processing tools. And then Joey Hannon is going to talk about his work with the Archives of Sena and Woody Solka. And then finally, Lauren Sorensen is going to talk about an in-process oral history project with the video with video engineers and artists makers. So I'm going to turn it over to Karen and Kathy. Thank you, Molly. Uh, and uh, thank you, everybody, for making it out today. It's a real honor to be talking. Um, with Kathy and with Mona about the work of the Experimental Television Center and the work that they did um, towards creating the book uh, project. I'd like to just also direct your attention if this material is fascinating to you, which I am only guessing it, it is to hear, um, the work of the Rose Goldson Archive um, and the fine people at Cornell University that have taken on the um, archives of the Experimental Television Center and are doing a great job in um, making that material available and accessible. So I'd like to just give a shout out to Desiree Alexander. She's here. I know she's at Mia um, and Tim Murray and all the other folks at Cornell. So again, my name is Carolyn Tennant and um, with Kathy. Um, and we're just going to be providing a little bit of a historical context for the work of the Experimental Television Center and where it was coming from. The Experimental Television Center was a unique regional media art center in the United States, a space for experiments in multidisciplinary research and practice in media and electronic art, both new and old. 
the ETC emphasized process over product, a shift in thinking about art making that resonates in contemporary art practices today, such as generative art. ETC was one of the formative places where cameraless or image processing video was originated. Their studios closed in 2011 after four years, hosting several hundreds of artists and collectives who participated in its residency program. During its tenure, the center served four key purposes as an ongoing studio residency space for electronic artists, a studio for the development of analog and digital media tools and tool design, as a facilitator of initiatives to preserve and archive the histories of media arts, and as an advocate for individual artists and organizations. Hi, everyone. Um, the Experimental Intelligence Center was located in a small village in upstate New York, Oingo, located 200 miles northwest of New York City. Operating outside New York City gave ETC certain advantages in terms of its funding support and how it functioned as a quiet retreat. It quickly grew into a space where artists from a variety of backgrounds could investigate what Gary Hill calls the, quote, electronic linguistics, unquote, of the medium of video. The center was started as a pedagogical experiment in 1969 called Student Experiments in Television Community Center for TV Production at the State University of New York at Binghamton by Ralph Hawking. Hawking, whose background was in pottery, sculpture, and photography, became interested in the newly developed portable video equipment, such as the Portapack, after meeting Nam June Haig in 1969. Hawking later moved the center off campus to become eligible for grants unavailable at the university. In the early 1970s, Ralph and Sherry Miller Hawking established the Experimental Television Center as an independent lab, not connected to any university, corporation, or museum. It was anti-establishment and not untypical of many media art centers that emerged during the countercultural movements of the late 60s and early 70s. Sustained by a growing gift economy that prevailed during that time, the center operated on grants, largely from the growing New York State Council of the Arts, which started funding electronic arts and video in the late 60s. In the 70s, there was a large increase of funding from two to $20 million for the arts. The ETC was an artist lab space that recombined analog and digital machines. Its rare but working machine tool collection was considered by some, especially in its later years, to be a hands-on living museum. Known as the system, this hybrid tool set, which was linked by a 64-point push-button switching matrix, which you can see in the middle, it's the red machine, uh, red interface in the middle of the screen, uh, facilitated interactive technologies between older, historically important analog instruments and new digital technologies that incorporated sonic and visual controls, such as software programs like Max MSP, Jitter, PD, and others. The system was developed as a, quote, thinking system of artist design tools. And as Ralph Hawking referred to it, the center was a learning place, this is his words, not a production house. <clears throat> the Experimental Television Center was a space for both tool access and development, where pre-existing machines were manipulated to design and build new ones using what we would call today a DIY, do-it-yourself tactics. Artists and engineers adapted video machines, such as industry keyers and colorizers, and then made these modified commercial broadcast equipment available to artists. Artists and, techn and technicians also collaborated to create new tools using reverse engineering and recombinant methods, sourcing materials for military and educational surplus. At the center, there was a fluid uh, crossing between the works of artists, engineers, and technicians. There were no labels. In fact, artists like Per Bode and Matthew Schlanger also worked as technicians at the center. Besides uh, setting up a laboratory for custom uh, 
tool building and studio space, the ETC also acted as a fundraiser, writing grants for artists to create their own unique tools and modify machines. Um, an example of this kind of crossover was Namju Pike and engineer Shuido Abe, who were in residence at the center when they developed the Pike Abe synthesizer for installation at the WNET TV lab in 1972. Namjoon remarked that the synthesizer was, quote, a sloppy machine like me. While in residence at the center, Pink also created several of his important video sculptures, including TV Bed and TV Cello, performed by collaborator Charlotte Mormon. The center supported many other important artists and their tool development, such as Woody and Stan Basilka, the Video Freaks Collective, Gary Hill, among others. ETC's commitment to uh, active dissemination of information and the democratization of media art histories is evidenced in the archiving initiative of the Video History Project. Mona Jimenez and Sherry Miller Hawking started this project in 1994, which went online in 1998, as a participatory way to include media art left out of the canon. Predating Wikipedia and other models of participatory databases, anyone could contribute materials and write in their own histories. The important work of making writings, manifestos, and schematics available to a wider uh, audience and public is aligned with the open source models championed at the center. In 2005, the ETC embarked on an important archival project funded by the Danielle and Guath Foundation to document their collection of early video tools. Some of the tools that have been preserved include those designed by Dave Jones. In 1973, the center began a long-standing relationship with the young self-taught technologists who designed and modified analog and digital tools such as the Jones Keyer colorizer buffer, as well as capture devices. About the work of tool building and the center, Ralph Hawking has said, my intention was to support as, mul as multi, many, as many uh, unconventional machinery as possible, while urging the usage of whatever we had uh, for the development of video art. And he furthers, instruments and systems at the ETC share certain traits, they are flexible and open-ended, have a branching architecture, and can be used by amateurs, and are both performative and generative. The center uh, functioned in a model of what Hakim Bey called a temporary autonomous zone, a place where radical actions and creation occurs outside of the constrictions of societal norms and cultural controls a place that functions like an incubator and a place of generative moments. The emergence of video processing tools book arose out of an urge to look at this period of tool building and tool development in the USA and to document the collaborations between artists, designers, and engineers, how they were funded, how ideas were shared, and how it all affected this new art form. So I very much uh, thank my collaborators, Mon Jimenez and Sherry Miller Hawking, for this, um, and, and Carolyn Tennant, and the others who participated in the book for this um, long, long-winded uh, time that it took us to get the book out. We worked on this for about 10 years altogether. Um, I also want to point to the DVDs that were concurrent to the development of the book. Carolyn has one of them, uh, actually both of them. The, um, there's one called The Early Media Instruments, which is at this point distributed by Signal Culture. And the other one is the ETC collection of over 70 artists' work that were produced at the center, which is distributed by Electronic Arts Intermix. Thank you all for your attention.
And he's talking about a, a tool that he developed, which is actually a combination of other tools. Uh, part of the, as, as Kathy and um, um, Carolyn alluded to, you know, um, part of the, the um, ethos or whatever of the, the time was that um, these were instruments, you know, these were, these were they're tools, so they're instruments as well. So they're, they're for a lot were used for real time across the real time performance and, um, and you would get, you know, feedback from, from seeing the monitor to what you were doing and it's very similar to playing an instrument. Um, so, you know, he says, I think of the Rudd Etra and the Herd as a combination of a guitar, the sounding board was the Rudd Etra, and the strings in the neck were the analog synthesizers and video synthesizers that drove them. And you can sit there and string your little wires together and come up with compelling abstract works of art. And I see no reason not to continue in that direction and to teach people that's, that's done, even though it's arcane. Well, let's face it, these wooden instruments are arcane too. The piano got invented, the piano should throw away the clarinet. So, um, so I love that, I love that quote. And I'm sorry, uh, please forgive me for those people who have read the essay of uh, Preserving Machines in the book, because I'm basically just going to tell you what it says, so uh, forgive me for that if you've already read, read the book. Um, so um, the Experimental Television Center, uh, as Kathy and Carolyn said, is so central to this whole uh, movement for um, artists and engineers to work together to produce tools. And it was also happening in other parts of the country, notably in Chicago at Circle Campus, um, and Dan Sandin and um, others in that area, and also on the West Coast. Um, what I want to talk about is just some concepts that, uh, that came out that are in this essay called Preserving Machines. Um, Dan Sand, and I'm just going to use this example of Dan Sandini's image processor. You can see him sitting there in front of the probably one of the first 1973. That's probably the first one. He he developed that through a um, university grant actually, because at this time the computing folks and artists and you know they were trying to figure out how um, how would, how would this technology sort of interactive technologies could be developed, and he developed this as a grant. But what was very unique about his work was that he also distributed uh, with Phil Morton. Um, well, Phil actually built the second one under Dan's tutelage, and then they distributed the, the um, instructions, and about 20 people made different uh, image processors. And this is one that was made by a man named Dick Sippel from the Midwest, I think, Indiana, I'm not sure, I'm positive. And so what it was was um, a series of modules that had that performed different kinds of analog uh, computing um, uh, processes on in, on on video signals, so that they would you would have certain kinds of um, effects. For example, uh, a um, what is the name of the one that mixes two signals together? I can't recall right at this moment. But there was a so there's a module for creating. Uh, a superimposition. There's a module for creating a key. So these are all like functions that we we see in television and video that are really uh, computational, analog computations. They're ways of combining different signals in order to um, to create certain kind of effects. Like a key, you know, is basically replacing part of a luminance scale. You know, a certain value on a luminance scale, a certain kind of black with another image, or a certain kind of white with another. So he did these, um, so his idea was to, to do that. Now this is labeled, but this is like not Dan Sandin's idea because you're never supposed to label. He thought you played it, again, like an instrument. So there was no reason to label it because you were playing it in real time. So there might be patterns that he would set up, but not, not, uh, not the actual, um, you know, that, that he wouldn't have instructions like this on the actual modules. So um, different people created different combinations of modules. So anyway, this, this, when I, this, this is just to say that when I started thinking about this concept of preserving machines, what I wanted to do was look at different types of, um, different areas of conservation. I look specifically at conservation. And one of the places I looked, I looked at instrument conservation, I looked at industrial conservation, and I looked at time-based media conservation to help guide, maybe get some ideas out about how to work with these machines. 
And I guess that's my first point, is that I think when we think about pre preserving machine, these are three great areas that we can look, but there probably are other areas and other collaborators that we can work with who can help to maintain these machines and maintain them in a useful way. And a, so that's artists, technologists, and conservators, and who knows, archivists, as Joey will talk about. Um, so I said in the book, yeah, that we need to we need to cross over and look at different ways of um, of uh, take different things from from each of those areas. You know, the, the instrument folks are really concerned with yes, you have to preserve the instrument, but if you don't play it, it doesn't make any sense. So you have to balance between the playing and the preserving. The folks from the industrial conservation really concerned about documentation and processes. When you change something, you move a capacitor around and put another capacitor in. What happens to that system? And maintaining all the different changes that people do when they're, they're fixing machines, right? Tractors and helicopters and what else. Um, and then uh, time based media, you know, really looking at artists' intent and looking at. Um, um, behaviors and all those kinds of things. So what does this tool really do? And you know, that's one of the things I'm, I want to show you a clip at the end that will, I think, demonstrate how these tools are be, have potentialities beyond what you might first expect them to have. So one of the things that I proposed in the book was that we need to do some kind of survey of instruments to actually find out what's out there. And nobody has done this yet. And please go forth and, um, and do this. And we developed for the book uh, uh, a um, cataloging template of, of uh, you, you can't read that, I know. Okay, Kath, I'm going to maybe make this big so they can, I don't know if we'll still see you or not. But. That's okay. Okay. Um, not that you're going to be able to read it, but you can look, I mean, you'll, you'll be able to read it better than, than you. Than, uh, so, um, but you can go ahead again and look in the book and look that and do it either. Um, there's so there's a proposal for um, you know, the types of information that you might want to collect, and there's two. It's a two-page form. So please do that. <laughs> Someone. Uh, <laughs> there's a Hearn Video Lab at Bayback. I don't know where else there are instruments, but I mean we do know. We can help with that. So let, so another point. You know, there's a ton of documentation. This is like a incredibly beautiful schematic made by Dave Jones, who, who uh, Kathy and Caroline mentioned. So there's a kind of documentation, and being able to understand and read that is, of course, part of our job as, um, as preservations. The other thing that a main point that I make in preserving machines is that I think we should use the same spirit of that time, which is the spirit of collaboration and exchange and putting things into a space where we can actually share and learn from each other. So, you know, I argue that, that we could have, we could have um, these, cons these conversations and these actions being taken place in collaborative spaces where artists and technologists and conservators and, you know, archivists and whoever um, can come together. This is Jane Beter. Um, that, you know, they used to travel with these like gigantic machines, these modules, and just set them all up. So we can do that again. Um, there have been some initiatives to try to get the tools out. This is something that Stan and Woody Masolka did, which is some photos from an exhibition they did in Austria where they built interfaces to the machines. So people weren't actually using the machines, they were actually using these interfaces, which are also another area that needs to be documented. Like, what are those interfaces, Joey? <laughs> Tell us, right? <laughs> But um, that was a great thing that resulted in a book um, that really is helpful to understanding uh, the tools. Also, there was something in New York called the Atro um, uh, Synthesizer Party, and that was where a bunch of different people got together who owned this one device called the Rat Atro and worked with each other to try to get them running again. And at the time, one of uh, um, Steve Rupp was, was still alive, and it's, it's, we've got some audio interviews from that time, and it was just a great, um, a great time. I visited a few times. Um, there's also, what's also interesting is, and I think these folks need to be part of the conversation, is the fact that there's people recreating or making new devices based on the same kinds of principles. So Dave Jones is one, and this is his. Um, 
what does it say there? What's the name of it? It's the IP, MVIP, Moving Image, Image Processor, something like that. Anyway, you can see, oh no, this is, this is, uh, this is the other one, yeah. There's a company that's making these modules that are equivalent to a module in the IP. So you can see the difference between the size of those. And, and then, sorry, I can't see this. Oh yeah, they're here. I just, it confused me when this PowerPoint's doing that thing, you know. And they're, <laughs> it's trying to help you over here, but I thought you can't. I, I should be looking here. But, um, and this is the MVIP that um, Dave Jones is building. He's basically trying to build the entire um, TV center in, by, through these modules. Uh, and so check him out D, uh, uh, um, Dave Jones Design on the web. Um, and, and the Experimental Television Center um, two years ago in an exhibition in New York showing all of, of much of their, of their history and work. And Dave designed, and uh, again, like an interface to his new tools um, that people could play with in the space. So, um, and also this is uh, a, new, a newer, this is the um, raster manipulation unit uh, created by Fake uh, and Shriya Abe and others who are at the TV center. Um, and, uh, but, but this one was built by, um, oh yeah, here, here, read this though. You know who's, who's it? Signal Culture. Jake, uh, you can probably Jason, read it. Jason, yeah. Um, well, he's one of the founders of this place called Signal Culture. So he's rebuilding this um, expanded television set. That was one of the first imaging devices that was built at the center. So I want to mention Signal Culture because, and has anybody been there for a residency? Anybody in the room? Oh. It's, it's a space for artists to work with the tools. They've set up tools. Um, so artists are actually producing new work, but one of the things they have is a researcher in residence, so you can go there and actually study an aspect of the tool, but you're again in this space. So I think that's like a beginning to being able to, um, to have this collaborative lab is having some space where artists are working with the tools and researchers are there and, and there can be that interaction. So, you know, you can apply to go for a week or two and, and do some work on um, preservation. So, um, and this is just a quote by Mary Lucia that I always like to put up anytime I talk about conservation of media arts. And she talks about us being in an ecosystem and that we are all parts of this ecosystem and we're, you know, what we do affects other people. And so I think that that's just a good thing to keep in mind that we, and again, in the spirit of the old days, that we are all part of, you know, what we do, whether it's repair a half inch up and real deck or work on a, imaging machine or whatever, we are affecting each other because we're, we're, we're um, part of this whole ecosystem together. So that's where I want to leave it. Thank you.
device, which uh, captured, I forget how many frames, I think 256 frames. Or, uh, so his early capture device, but you see that it builds in a keyer, which means that he, he'll explain, but there are some parameters that you can, so it's more than a capture device, is what I want to say, so check it out. And do it, which allows you to Sequentially, the live image gets stored on frame two, then three, then four, etc. If we're not keying, then we're just seeing basically the live image as if we had a single frame. But when we stop recording that image, we then see a sequence of those 32 frames played over and over again. Okay, so what we're seeing is a sequence of the 32 frames that were stored from the tape being played over and over again. Under computer control, we can vary the speed of that playback so that the frames are being played back slower or they're being played back quickly. We can also play the frames in forward or in reverse order. And we can change it at any point during the sequence of the 32 frames. So if we go back to keying on the live image, the live image is slowed down to the speed that we've set the computer at. So we're only seeing now one frame out of every so many frames from the, the live image, uh, which is a jellyfish, by the way, shot by Hank Rudolph, um, or videotaped by Hank Rudolph. Uh, as we speed up the buffer, the tape is being superimposed and stored in the frames in real time at full speed. As we slow that speed down, the tape is still playing at full speed, putting images into the buffer, but the buffer is only looking at one out of every so many frames from the tape and then storing that on one frame of the buffer, moving on to the next frame of the buffer, <coughs> waiting a few frames, storing that, and so on. So we get a kind of a, a pseudo slow motion, even though the tape is still playing at normal speed. Uh, in fact, there's the tape playing at normal speed. The, because the keyer of the buffer is building the images on top of the 32 frames, we're actually looking back in time at a uh, layering of probably the last several minutes building up the image. So it's, even though we're only looking at a sequence of 32 frames, we're looking at pieces of images from hundreds of frames, maybe even thousands of frames. So, I mean, I don't know if you could follow that, but they, and I said 256 frames, my eye must have been crazy, but it's 32 frames, so you understand that he's storing those frames. And then he's basically at the live image, which is keyed over, and so that's also being captured on certain frames. So that there's this whole potentiality within the instrument that is much more than an image capture device. So really, when I was first working on them, I thought, oh yeah, everybody wanted to move from analog to digital, but that wasn't really what was happening at all, actually. It was using digital tools to try to control analog video. 
So, um, so this uh, ident you know, just to, so in this image capture device are all these ways that you can adjust parameters on, on luminance and color and all those kinds of things. And you see he has that control panel, which is from the Amiga computer. So that was a way, uh, you know, it's programmed, you made a little program to be able to control the device. So there's all this, it's much more than the box. And that's, I think, what we really need to understand. So, um, we'll be showing. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'm very honored to be included on this panel. Um, I never miss an opportunity to give it up for Mona Jimenez too, because uh, she connected me to the project that I'm about to talk about. So without her, I would have pretty much nothing to say today. So thank you, Mona. Um, my name is Joey Heinen. I currently work at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in Collections, Information, and Digital Assets. But for the purposes of today's presentation, I'll be sharing a project I helped with in 2013 and 2014 during my studies at NYU's Moving Image Archive and Preservation Program, working on behalf of artists Dana and Woody Vasulka um, and the archives of the University of Colorado in Boulder. Uh, during this time, I was assisting the Vasulkas with the donation of their collection of video, software, digital files, documents, and photographs to the Boulder Archive. During the summer of 2013, I worked with the Basilicas in their home and studio in Santa Fe, New Mexico, performing a survey of the collection to identify preservation risks and contextualize the material in their immense and multifaceted collection of art and ephemera. The most pressing concern was a triage of over 2,000 videotapes determining the at-risk formats and the highest generation of material in the collection to be digitized. And currently, I poured over the various installation diagrams, equipment manuals, schematics, shot lists, notes, and various scribblings from the archive to determine their relationship to an artwork or phase of exploration. This was largely done through the Basilica's own recollection of the materials and technologies, as well as contributions from various friends and collaborators who were frequent surprise guests at the house. Uh, following the summer, I returned for my final year at MIAP in order to finish my studies, continuing to facilitate relations between the Basilicas and Boulder to ensure the project was moving along and that groups of materials were making their way to digi the digitization vendor, along with the inventory I created for intellectual control. I also embarked on a rigorous research project to explore some of their more technologically complex works in order to form what Woody liked to call a technical curriculum for their work namely an understanding of the technical processes employed in their work and constant experiment, experimentations along the way, placing them within a history of the current technological landscape to demonstrate their immense innovative contributions. Uh, but to back up for a moment, let me tell you more about the Pasulkas. Famously referred to as pioneers of new media and especially video art, Stena and Woody Pasulka have a career that spans six decades and was constantly at the forefront of what was technologically possible in experimental image and immersive experience making. They are especially lauded for their involvement in the creation of image processing tools, which is the discussion for today. While they worked with many tools throughout their career, today I want to focus on the tool that is perhaps their masterpiece, which they built along with Jeff Shire. Um, they were living and working in Buffalo at the time, this is 1976, and enlisted Jeff Shire, a local computer engineering student, to assist them in creating a machine that could create, manipulate, and synthesize digital images. Um, eventually, this uh, took the name of the Digital Image Articulator, or the Articulator for short. The Vasulkas began their experiments in digital images in 1976 with Don MacArthur, enlisting Jeff uh, following MacArthur, MacArthur's departure from the project. It is both a blessing and a curse that they fully documented the development process creating copious notes, diagrams, and manuals for the tool as it was in development, 
and videotaping their sessions with Jeff. It is a blessing as the material to support Encoin's study of the articulator is endless, both to aid in preservation slash use of the machine, but also to place it in a history of media and innovation in computer science. However, it is at times also a curse, as so many notes lead to uncertainties about what random scribblings and draft manuals can be considered as authoritative evidence of what went into the end product, not to mention the fact that the work of the articulator was highly iterative, as the Vesulkas and Shire effectively used the tool as a means for understanding the emergence of digital technologies, which at that point in time was largely unavailable to average consumers. For the archival project in Boulder, Wyndham Hanaway of GW Hanaway & Associates has been feverishly working through the video uh, to create digital preservation masters. And just this past Monday, I received a trove of material that I requested for this presentation. It is just helping me to begin to understand how the boxes of paper in the archive relate to the tool, and in essence is the crux of what I want to share today that collections such as the Vesulkas are the linchpin in connecting the work and the supporting materials to tell a rich and compelling history of technological innovation and the use of these materials in artistic communities. It was very much the Vesulka style to keep everything that resulted from their explorations, often turning the camera on as they fiddled away. The recordings I'm showing today have perhaps never been seen besides when they were initially created and referred back to during the development of the articulator. The clips are meant to further illustrate the basic building blocks of the tool and how to operate it. Also, hopefully demonstrating how the Basilicas and Shire expanded on the sophistication of the tool across time as they enriched their understanding of pixel isolation and manipulation. The articulator was a custom-built computer using several key components, an A to D converter, which allowed for two inputs, which were invoked by a selector, a lookup table for color mapping based on RGB color coordinates, which could be either generated at whim or could modify a live camera or recorded video feed, which further necessitated use of a Genlock sync generator clock and frame buffer to facilitate real-time video processing. Um, an LSI 11 microcomputer was the main interface for the system, which included an RT11 operating system and could load pre-programmed sequences stored on floppy disks. The resulting mixed video feed was passed through to a D to A converter and an RGB to NTSC color rector. However, two components were especially essential and innovative to allow for the control and manipulation of digital images. The XY control and timing bus allowed the user through the LSI 11 microcomputer to map individual scanning lines, columns, or pixels to store the color information in the buffer. The arithmetic logic unit, or ALU for short, provided the user with a menu of arithmetic or logic functions, which allowed for mixing of the two video feeds and addition or subtraction of visual data, or offsets, to create unique and sometimes unintentional animation effects. Additionally, as they expanded on the resolution and bit depth of the video, they could expand upon the precision of patterns and isolation of data sequences to allow for greater control of the effects and the imagery. It's worth reiterating that Shire and the Vasulkas built this computer system themselves, interfacing these components in highly original ways. But don't take my word for it, let's hear from Jeff Shire as he gives a tour of the articulator and demonstrates some of its basic functions. Side of the screen, you want uh, our matching number sitting next to these diskettes over here. Notice it's number matching number 63757. This is the key number. Now, all of you sitting in your seats should now, or standing in your seats, should remember 63757. I'll repeat that again. Don't tell anybody. Okay, very well, sir. We'll start that again. 171044. We're going to place in the number 63757. Got that? Okay, good. It's an important number. Mm -hmm. And now we have our test pattern on the screen that. Um, says that things are working properly. You can see in the back monitor there we have some kind of pattern of sorts. So far, leash it, man. I'm now we're going to start up this whole deal and see what we can get. And we should definitely call bar bar by Walter Wright. Okay, there it goes. Now what it's indicating in the background, the red bar, is something we call our Ys. That was something called Y2. This is Y3. Next will come Y4. Now what these numbers are, are their binary divisions of the raster. Uh, y is, X, Y is what we call them. It's um, from Cartesian coordinates. X is on the horizontal. Y is on the vertical. 
And what it does is divide the raster up into um, X and Y's. And we can have various divisions. Finer divisions are the higher X's. Now this is the first X that you can see. This is X2, X3, this red bar. <coughs> No, this is X4. This is X4. There's a there's a there's one missing there which we don't show. Okay, it's called 4, 8, and 16. Those are um, 3, 4, 5, 6, right? Um, what it's doing is dividing by 2, then it divides by 4, then it divides by 8, then it divides by 16, then it divides by 32, then it divides by 64, then it divides by 128, then it divides by 256, then it divides by 5, 12. And that's our division of the screen. We divide the X and Y's into 1 to 512. My voice was computerized there, but you heard the voice going up. Okay, and what the program is now doing is running through the red, green, and blue bars. This is uh, Y2, or we call it division by um, 2 of the screen, division by 4 of the screen, uh, the black and white bars. This is the basis for our other units to use. We can use this as an input signal, or we can use this as um, a position specifier on the screen. And we have those two modes. One is uh, input, and another as, um, as a dressing mode, is what we call it. So this, this X, Y can allow us to specify any point on the, on the screen in a 512 by 482 matrix. And so let's say if we add a number to this, or continuously add a new number to this reference, we can shift it. Let's shift it on the X, shift it on the Y. We'll show you a shifting on the X, maybe. That's shifting on the X in one direction, say, I guess. Shifting on the X. We can reverse the direction, shift it to the left instead of the right. For you with television sets upside down, shifting right to the left. Okay, we'll do that right now. Just taking the number 400, and now we'll do it this way. Go to the left. We can just, just by changing the number we add, instead of adding one, we subtract one. What? Yeah, well, you see now we are, that's changing the x to a y, a y to an x. I like it. Sure, I can, I can do an x band. Okay, so now, good, so that'll make it easier. That's why we did this at all, was to save the camera. Yeah, no, I mean, you either have the hand, so you have the computer. And it's going up, I guess. Put that down. Well, the camera's up, I guess. So that's up. We can, we can also go down again for all of you minus and such. Okay? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. okay, let's jump forward. We're going to look now at um, A plus B. Now, the interesting thing is since these are X, Y, we get a stair step. So we're going to show you the staircase. Maybe we should give it away. Okay, now we'll try addition. What do we have here? <laughs> look at that. It's a staircase. <laughs> and this is caused by addition of adding the vertical and horizontal. And by the staircase, we can show you the minus. And let's see what that, let's see what minus would do. This is the minus function. Look at that, the staircase reverses. So that's one of the arithmetic type functions. Now it doesn't look like the logic function. Pretty much different. Now the interesting part, the more interesting part is saying, what happens if we mix the logic and arithmetic functions now? And the next, as an example, we're going to do something called A or B plus 1. Okay, we're going to now show you that. This is kind of, I like these kind of things right here. And we get a pattern like this. Now you can see in the background the OR function, which I'll switch back to right now. The OR is sitting like this. That's not the OR that we want. Oh, it's similar to that. That's, um, yeah, let's get this back into it. Yeah, this is the OR alone. Is that the OR? Come on, Jeffrey. Okay. And this is OR plus 1. As you notice, this light change there. That's the OR. That's the OR plus 1. And it adds in all those extra squares. You're from where? From, from the middle air? No, it's actually adding to the, what it's doing right now, it's just doing first the logic function in the background. Then it's adding one to each square and saying whatever a square is very close to the brightest will add one more to it. So that actually adds one and those squares happen to be pretty bright, they become brighter. It's mixing an arithmetic mode with a logical mode and it doesn't have to be a, a coincidence. It doesn't have to make sense either. <laughs> so this demonstrates the most basic ways that they learned how to isolate and manipulate specific pixels or areas of the video grid and create new effects. As they improved upon the assembly language and could write discrete programs and place them as sequences of memory, they created more and more advanced forms of digital imagery.
feeling very good. Oh, this is it. This is it. Oh, okay. Fine. Okay. Ah, that's right. No, I should keep the pause. No, you shouldn't. But that's all right. That's something. Oh, oh very good. Nice. <laughs> Are you recording this thing? Yeah. You're recording everything? Um, 
So while they're still at this point digitizing, the material they have received is still unprocessed, but I hope to continue to be of service in creating the technical curriculum that the Basilkas have dreamed of for their life's work. Thank you. Last year, um, the DICA uh, community archive stream met, so I have no slides. Um, <laughs> um, and this is going to be a very quick um, presentation. Um, my uh, focus is kind of a bit more overarching than the past uh, presentations, but I'm so honored to be on this panel with um, people that I, whose work I've followed for so long and my mentor, um, Mona Jimenez. Um, and I want to thank uh, Molly for being such a great collaborator and putting this panel together. Um, so, uh, yeah, my name is Lauren Sorensen. I am self-employed self as a consultant specializing in media preservation, um, but I'm here in my other capacity as a doctoral student in information studies at UCLA. Um, I, uh, I'm a little bit of an outlier here, like I said, um, but I'm hoping that discussions of equipment, obsolescence, and video preservation more generally can be productively discussed um, in this kind of a panel um, on video processing tools and equipment. Um, so as Molly said in introducing, um, I work on research related to video obsolescence in archives, and I'm especially interested in communities of practice between um, technology and cultural heritage, whether that be um, contemporary digital preservation um, and uh, working with our archivists, working with technologists, um, or earlier manifestations of this, such as um, artists kind of turning into technologists um, uh, by default, um, and how that kind of manifests itself in, that, in the archival community. Um, so at, at the moment, we have a situation where um, video engineers who maintain and repair analog playback decks are retiring, um, and we risk losing a lot of that tacit knowledge. Um, so there is a need uh, to capture that knowledge, and one way of doing that is uh, through oral history. Um, so I'm still in the early stages of designing the research project, but um, one of the kind of steps that I want to do is do kind of a, I'm basically doing a research study that's kind of a preliminary study, basically. So it's kind of um, making some kind of a present day context and scaffolding around um, the oral history project to support in creating these histories in a context. Um, so I decided to pursue another uh, short interview project in advance, which I think will allow for threads that might tie cultural heritage use of equipment with the production context in a kind of historical trajectory. Um, so what I'm going to be discussing briefly today is a, re a, a preliminary research uh, question that I'm currently working on that attempts to look at the state of the field for audiovisual archives with analog videotape collections. Um, the goal being to interview um, audiovisual archivists, maybe you, um, about your practices around conservation and preservation of video, um, highlighting the role of analog videotape playback machines, and speaking to the specific barriers for individual archives uh, through interviews with staff and analysis of policy as it is available. Um, so uh, I'm just going to skip down a bit um, here and say, uh, so, um, yeah, sorry. Let's see. Um, so for many movie image archives and archives that acquire movie image materials, barriers such as costly digitization, lack of technical expertise, and obsolescing equipment can work to inhibit access to these items for researchers. Um, and my research question is really how and to what degree is preservation of moving images from an analog video source impeded by magnetic media carrier loss and the technical and economic challenges that surround that loss. So it's a very big question, um, but I'm trying to focus it kind of around um, the idea of how that impacts um, uh, uh, colleagues and people who are doing the labor of archives. Um, so the idea in, in, is that in sharing this short summary of my initial research question here to Mia <coughs> and discussing this work in the context of video processing tools, we can attempt to point to questions of, of what preserving video and potentially equipment for archives can entail and locating that production equipment to archive line might live, that kind of historical trajectory that line. Um, so the idea being that this would be a precursor study to that oral histories project. So. And this is the culmination of my talk. Um, so if you are an uh, audiovisual archivist or a video engineer, or you know of video engineers um, interested in speaking with me about this topic um, after hearing this preliminary uh, talk here, very short talk, um, please let me know. Um, and uh, please, I'm, I'm totally available. Um, my website is laurensorensen.info. Um, you can reach me at laurens at nyu.edu, or you can find me on Twitter at laurensx. Uh, 
so if you know anyone, uh, please let me know and get in touch. Thank you so much. but I can say um, a couple of things. Uh, Jason Bernicozzi and Eric Souther uh, have both been working on the development of a lot of apps that can emulate um, some of the systems. Um, and even moving into, I think that they just uh, released a slit scan app um, that uh, I saw a demo of recently via Facebook. Um, the Burning Goes is actually relocated, but Signal Culture is still um, alive and, and well and uh, doing the residency program. Um, so I, I know Mona and Kathy both have held residencies there, so maybe you can speak to that. Well, I, uh, I, I, um, I, don't I don't remember my residency there, but <laughs> no, I, mean, I mean, it was it was a restful time being around friends, and I, but I didn't have any specific, um, it was more like thinking about what I want to work on rather than working on it. But anyway, um, I do know of two, I know that there's, um, that Athena Holbrook is working on documentation of the Jones Buffer, which I showed the video of. Uh, I know that she's given a couple of talks about that, but I'm not sure how far she is along. She definitely had a residency there. Um, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, when I had the residency, they were just starting the program, and then I did encourage them to invite and communicate with preservationists. So that's, so they really jumped on that, and um, I know there have been other people, but I, you know, some, I think some people come to work on specific tools. Some people come just to learn about the system and, um, yeah, so I'm not, I guess on their website, though, we could pull up their website. We have a picture of them. And we could probably see who's been doing Kathy, did, did you have any comments about this? Um, just the thing that's interesting about the um, signal culture is that Dave Jones and Hank Rudolph have been very much involved with it in the development of the residency programs. And Hank was one of the persons, people who, um, facilitated artists when they came to the studio at ETC and introduced them to it. And Dave, as you know, and we've heard, you know, has developed many of the instruments. So the fact that they're both deeply involved in it still is really quite a gift to the community. Um, they also, as Mona said, they have not only research residencies, but uh, residencies to make work, and then they have a tool-making residency, which, so they get all of these different people together, and they're, they're very committed uh, to building community and having people, uh, you know, in the same space, eating meals together, making work together, exchanging ideas, and so I really applaud them for the work they've done on uh, developing this. And, uh, and it's a great place to go. Yeah. Recommend it. And they're also um, incorporating like Dave's new tools that live with the um, the MVIP and some other tools into the system. So they have both yeah. analog and digital uh, tools, which is always which is 
always been a part of the center's work, but this is a, this is a new system, and it's not the actual collection of the center. So, um, but yeah, so they're working in a lot of that, and I think a lot of artists come with, with tools, with software, and so there's a lot of experimentation happening in that regard. So this may be a newbie question, but is there a registry of equipment across multi-institutional uh, facilities, so it sort of tracks equipment by uh, where it is, <coughs> and sort of like uh, cross pollinate. Yeah, I think that one was Toolmaker, uh, there's profiles for all the all the res uh, researchers and toolmakers who have been in residence. Ha, ha, ha.